the dollar was always pegged to gold. That was that was the anchor of the whole system. But if you ran into traded deficit problems, there was a swing lender. The swing lender was the International Monetary Fund. That was really the role of the International Monetary Fund at the beginning. Now, throughout the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, it's become this like global monetary policeman. They impose all kinds of deals. They make loans. They made multi-billion dollar loans to Ukraine a couple of years ago. Ukraine did not meet any of the criteria for a borrower, but obviously it was political. So the IMF has become like the finance arm of the U.S. State Department and uh, a highly, highly political organization wandered very far from its original intention. But the original intent was that if you were in a little distress, the IMF could make you a loan of gold or dollars, then that would buy time for you to fix whatever problem it was. Maybe you needed to lower your unit labor costs. Maybe you needed to create more efficiency, reduce regulation, raise taxes, whatever the case might be, you would buy time and then you could get back on it and keep the exchange rate. But sometimes that didn't work. Either it was politically infeasible, like, you know, hey, we're not going to raise taxes or, you know, we're going to lose an election or we can't squash wages because we'll have strikes and we actually have to devalue. And when that happened, you could do that. There was a process, you would devalue against the dollar. Indirectly, you were devaluing against gold, but the dollar gold peg was the anchor and you would devalue against the dollar. So the IMF was a swing lender and it was a forum for discussing terms and conditions of devaluation if that's what it took. And of course, the famous crack ups were the uh, devaluation of pound sterling in 1967 and again in 1974, and there were others, but that was the process. And they created two other organizations. One was the World Bank, which was for developing economies, not the developer. where they were supposed to lend to encourage development in what today we call emerging economies. Back then, probably would have called it the third world, but they were to help the poorest countries. And there was something called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which later became the World Trade Organization. And that's a, a multilateral organization for negotiating reductions in tariffs whenever possible. So you really had three Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, and was now the World Trade Organization. A very, very ambitious set of organizations. By the way, they're all still around. We're off the gold standard, have been for a long time. We'll talk about 1971, Nixon, and closing the gold window and all that. But all three of those institutions, it was signed in July 1944. Through the 1950s, this worked fairly well and into the 1960s. But by the mid to late 60s, it started to break down. And the principal reason was that the U.S. never had enough gold to cover all the dollars. Now, under a classic gold standard, you don't necessarily have to have that. The Austrians would bang the table and say, you have to have 100% gold, et cetera. But that's not true. In the 19th century, the Bank of England ran a successful gold standard with about 20% coverage. Until the end of World War II, the U.S. ran a gold standard with 40% coverage. Then we lowered it to 25%. Then we uh, abandoned the gold, what's called the gold cover ratio. We abandoned it completely in 1968 during the Vietnam War. That was the whole guns and butter crack up under LBJ, under Lyndon Baines Johnson. But even as early as the 1960s, you could see what was happening. In 1950, just after World War II, beginning of the Bretton Woods era, the United States had 20,000 tons of gold. By 1970, we had 9,000 tons of gold. Where did the 11,000 tons go? Well, the answer is 3,000 to Germany, 2,500 to France, 2,500 to Italy, um, 600 to Japan, et cetera. And as we had all these trading partners and the way the system worked at the time, if you ran a trade deficit, that meant you got their stuff. So we were buying transistor radios and Toyota cars and Sony TVs and French wine and taking vacations in Switzerland. But that meant all those dollars were going overseas and those trading partners who had these dollar surpluses could cash them in for gold. And they did. And we sent them the gold. And that was how the system worked. But by the late 60s, a run on the bank had developed. A couple of things happened. One was there was a private market that was set up side by side with the official market. So the official market was $35 an ounce. The private market, it could be $40 an ounce, $41 an ounce. It wasn't wild. It wasn't $200 an ounce, but even a couple of bucks was what traders call an arbitrage. It was free money. So what France could do, they could cash in dollars for gold at $35 an ounce, turn around and sell the gold in the market for $40 an ounce. That's practically risk-free and you make an easy profit. And if you want to leverage it, you can make even more. And that was happening, but but more to the point, countries were putting the gold in their vaults. So there came a time when Charles de Gaulle sent a destroyer to New York to pick up his gold to bring it back to France, but you know, with the uh, 
uh, under the auspices of the French Navy. So that was exhilarating. And it was because there wasn't uh, two things were true. One, there was never enough gold. It was all based on confidence. But two, the confidence was eroding because the U.S. ran massive trade deficits and budget deficits, the twin deficits at the same time. Now, there's a case for that. They, and this was kind of what the Marshall Plan was all about in a, in a much smaller way. But as time went on, you know, I mean, at the end of World War II, Germany was in rubble. Japan was in flames and ashes, but they were important economies and we needed friends to face off against the Soviet Union. So it's very much in our interest to help those countries get back on their feet. Well, how could they do that if they didn't have any money, they didn't have any gold, they didn't have any credit? Well, they did have something though. They had human capital, they had engineering expertise, they had been the large industrial economies before the war. So what they really needed was some money. <laughs> and some credit uh, but you could extend that to them so that they could get manufacturing going and then they paid it by exporting stuff so again the we ran in the 60s the volkswagen beetle was was a popular item ja you know I japanese transistor radios took them to the beach you know etc but that meant the, we the united states had to run trade deficits so that we could run a capital surplus meaning we would have the capital to put into these countries and they were the opposite they ran trade surpluses but had capital deficits because they were borrowing all this money. But it worked. Uh, it worked. It got the money around. And then, you know, the, a little bit later, the petrodollar deal was just the uh, ultimate extension of that in 1974. But the problem was confidence was eroding. People were like, how long is the U.S. going to run these deficits? What do they expect us to do? Pile up dollars forever? I mean, the Germans and the Japanese actually did, but the French, Swiss, and the Italians were not so uh, sympathetic. And they developed a run on the bank, on Fort Knox, uh, that the goal was going down fast. It was very clear that the goal was soon going to be depleted if Nixon didn't do something. So he got together with John Connolly, who was Secretary of the Treasury, Arthur Burns, who was head of the Fed, Paul Volcker, who was not head of the Fed. This is 1971. Volcker was Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. So he had Volcker, but he probably knew the most about international economics. He had Volcker. And they went to Camp David uh, for the weekend. And they knew that they were going to have to devalue the dollar against gold. They knew that's where it was going to end up. There was just no way they could maintain the $35 because we were running out of gold. What they said was uh, that we are temporarily suspending the redemption of gold for our foreign trading partners. But uh, they said, we're going to have another Bretton Woods conference and we're going to devalue the dollar to some new level to be negotiated and devalue the dollar against other currencies which they did. That conference took place in Washington in December of 1971. It was called the Smithsonian Accord or the Smithsonian Agreement because that's where they had some of the meetings. They did devalue the dollar from $35 an ounce to $42 an ounce, which is a 20% devaluation. They actually did everything they said they were gonna do, except for one thing. They never went back to, to convertibility. Now saying the dollar was now worth a different amount in gold is a bookkeeping exercise, but we never went back to a system where foreign trading partners could cash in dollars for gold. And there were some reasons for that. One of them was Germany, what would have been about the strongest currency in the world at the time, but they were trying to honor Bretton Woods. They were trying to maintain this peg to the dollar. There was no Euro at the time, it was the Deutschmark. So Germany was in effect selling their own currency to suppress the price and buying dollars, but they were up to their eyeballs in dollars. And finally they said, we're just gonna go to a floating exchange rate. We're just gonna, we're gonna let the market figure it out. You know, and of course the, the Deutsche Mark soared immediately, which devalued the dollar, which is what we were trying to do in the first place. So one by one countries went on the floating exchange rate. So by the time you got to December, this was all over the course of 1971, some before and some after August 15th. But by the time you got to December 1971, it was kind of over. Uh, a lot of countries had gone to floating exchange rates. Milton Friedman advocated it. He was wrong for a lot of reasons, but he was the big voice of the time. It seemed to work okay. And everyone's like, yeah, what's with this gold standard? What's with fixed exchange rates? Why let them float. And if your country's you know, in distress and you got to cheapen your dollar, let the cheapen relative to the dollar, let the market do that for you. Or if, if the dollar has to devalue, let the market do it for you. We don't need the IMF turning the dials and we don't need fixed exchange rates. So they never went back. 